frugality has become fun again. And it's actually fun to say that that's really not part of my financial goals right now, but here's what we're doing that's best for us financially. You're listening to The Life and Money Show, a podcast that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth for their families and impacting the world around them. And now here are your hosts, Annie Dickerson and Julie Lamb. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another riveting episode of The Life and Money Show. I'm Annie. Dickerson here with Julie Lamb. Julie, how are you today? Yeah, I'm awesome. I love that intro right there. Another riveting episode. Let's do this. That's right. Got to keep it fresh. Got to keep the listeners engaged and excited because we love on our listeners. We love them. They're the entire reason we do this and do everything that we do. But I'm very excited about today's episode. Today, we are talking with Derek Kinney. He is the creator of Good Money Framework, and he's host of the Good Money Podcast. I just love, I don't know, maybe it's because we're good egg investments, but I'm so partial to that word good. It just makes you feel good. And I don't know, I love the pairing of good and money because so many people just have such conflicted experiences with money and baggage around money, emotional hangups around money. And what I love about what Derek does as a financial advisor and now as a full financial entrepreneur is that he coaches people around their money stories and really helps them to develop a healthy relationship with money so that they can do good things with their money, hence good money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's so funny because I feel like something he said in the show about the tie cash to cause money to meaning profits to their purpose just so resonated with me in what we do at Good Egg in our business, in our coaching business, as well as what we do at Good Egg. And I know also is representative of so many of the people that we have on this show as well. It always seems like we always ask the question, okay, you made all this money, you've had all this success, now what? And why aren't you sitting on a beach somewhere sipping margaritas and enjoying your life? And it always seems to come back to that they want to find a way to leverage the gifts that they've been given with freedom, without being bound to their own needs that they need to serve, right? Through whether it's having food or housing or whatever, or a certain lifestyle that they want to achieve, but that they kind of are able to do that with the lifestyle that they've created. And then the next thing for them is giving back. And I love that. I love that that's kind of the center of what he talked about. And it was also so fun to hear from an entrepreneur standpoint, how he was able to, with very little experience, go out there and found a way to build credibility with him reaching out to producers and morning shows and things like that and how that helped him to uh, get his start when he didn't have any clients of his own when he first ventured into becoming a financial advisor. So, and then we got to talk about kids and money and- Yeah, and, that was know, so oh, cool. Yeah, and the thing that I took away, like I said on the show- was just integrating your kids from a young age and having them be part of the conversation around money. And I know that's the same for you as it was for me. The conversation around money was pretty simple, right? There was no really discussion. It was, you go out there, you work a job, you save your money, and maybe you buy a home. And that was it, right? We didn't really talk about you save was the big point that I got in my home. But it's so cool that you and I have the opportunity as well as our listeners to hear the importance around having people get more engaged with their kids in these conversations earlier on. I think the next generation is going to be totally different, which is some, a lot of what he talked about too. So- Indeed. And for all of the parents out there who are listening, be sure to listen all the way through to the end because there's a section where we talk about saving for college and what the future of college might look like and where Derek thinks it's headed and the advice he has for parents who are on that path of having those conversations with their kids and saving for college and the best way to go about that. Now, for all of our listeners, there's lots of ways you can build wealth. And that's what we do on the show is we help introduce you to lots of different ways to build wealth, whether it's through stocks, through land investing, or through real estate syndications like we do. 
And so if you are new to the world of real estate syndications and passive investing, a great place to start is to get a copy of our book. It's called Investing for Good. And we have a free copy for all of you. I just heard myself say that, Investing for Good. And we're going to talk with Derek of Good Money Framework. And we are good egg investments. So much goodness. But for all of our listeners, if you haven't already, be sure to grab a free copy of our book. You can go to goodegginvestments.com slash book to get all the details. And without further ado, let's do it. Let's jump into our conversation with Derek Kinney. Derek, welcome to the show. How are you? It is so good to be with you both, Julie and Annie. Great to be here. It's a real honor for me. Oh, we're thrilled that you've chosen to spend some time with us and our listeners today. Now, Derek, as real estate investors and syndicators, we talk to a lot of people about money, which is a topic that most people shy away from because it's just awkward. It feels uncomfortable or taboo to talk about, or sometimes it comes with a lot of baggage, right? Which is why it's so refreshing to have you on the show today because With your extensive background in wealth management and complex financial topics, you teach people to put meaning behind their money and shed a positive light on money through your Good Money Framework and Good Money Podcast. So start by sharing with us, Derek, what were your own money beliefs growing up and what did your own parents teach you about money? Yeah, it's interesting. I've always had a like of money. And it's interesting thinking back, even when I was a kid, I used to do some odd jobs around the house or sort of invent businesses to make money for myself. One was a bicycle inspection business of all things. I would inspect our neighbor's bikes and our own family's bikes and make up these little fake inspection stickers, checking the tires and the brakes and the handlebars. They might pay me a dollar, but to me, that was like hitting the lottery back then. I would Oh my clean gosh, driveways. you were born to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I just always loved it. And I remember back, even as a kid, sitting on the living room floor of my grandparents' house in Wenatchee, Washington, and there was an old Sears and Roebuck catalog, and there was a go-kart picture. And I thought my life would be so complete if I just had that go-kart, a couple hundred dollars. I actually didn't end up getting it, but it really gave me a sense of saving for something that was important to me. So when I think about my own parents, My dad was a metallurgical engineer. He passed away about a year ago. And my mom would work part-time to help just make ends meet. And I grew up in a house where it looked like all of our needs were met as kids, but you don't really realize how sort of lower middle class that you were until you're older and can reflect back on really how small that house was and the sacrifices your parents made. But I never saw them banging their fists and saying money was bad, but What I did see was a lack of it, but I saw a sacrifice on their part really to do whatever it took to help my sister and I be as successful as we could be. Interesting. Yeah. In many ways, I think that mirrors my own experience growing up and same money was scarce when I was growing up, but my parents really, I saw them, I watched as they worked double shifts all around the clock to make ends meet. And they always had put such a high value on education. And so it sounds like your parents were good, honest, hardworking folks and really supported you and your sister. And here you were, right? And you're like, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try inspecting bikes. I'm going to go and clean for people or do this for people. And so I'm curious as a kid, it sounds like you didn't have a whole lot of entrepreneurs around you or did you to set that example? I didn't. And that's something that really held me back, I think, in my own business growth. It's funny you ask that because only later on in life did I learn that my grandfather was really the first true entrepreneur in our family. He bought and owned the two-room house that my grandmother and he lived on that we would go visit for two weeks every summer. 
but he had a cherry orchard behind that house right there in the Columbia River in Wenatchee, Washington. So he would get up really early, the break of dawn to go walk around in his rubber boots and make sure all the, the cherry trees were taken care of. And he would come back at night and do the same thing. His day job, though, was at Alcoa on what was called the pot line, I've learned, basically putting metal in to melt it, to shape it. This was not an air conditioned, sit in your own cubicle type of job. So he worked hard sun up to sundown, but he also had some rental properties, which I was a big fan of. And so only later on in life did I realize he was really the first entrepreneur. So to really give you a metaphor of how important that was to me, when he passed several years ago, my mom called and said, hey, Derek, what would you like from grandpa as a reminder? And I said, well, what I want is a physical object that actually touched his body. So my mom was able to find his hard hat that says Alcoa on the top with his miner's lamp on it. And there was a picture of me, of all things, having fun sitting on his lap. So in a shadow box, I've got his hard hat and a picture of he and I, and it's right in my office right now. And it's a reminder to me, look, Derek, when you face adversity, when things get hard, remember your grandfather because he set the example for you and you want to keep making him proud and also just keep using the tools you've been given to grow your business. So it's a very emotional, but it's a very meaningful thing for me to think back on. Mm-hmm. What a legacy that he left for sure. And it's clear it was in your genes, even if you didn't find out about it maybe till later in life. But okay, so here you were, this kid, and you're trying different things, you're trying to help people. And really, that's what entrepreneurship is about, right? Trying to figure out what problems people have and figuring out solutions for them. And so let's fast forward. So you have your childhood growing up, you're learning about money. Money is scarce, but you're trying to be creative and come up with these different solutions, almost to strike out on your own. And so then what happened in your young adulthood and where did you go then? So I graduated college. I went to our local university here in Arlington, Texas, and my dad always whispered in my ear, just get your degree. It's a stepping stone for things yet to come. So I always gravitated toward communication. I loved giving speeches and loved just the whole aura of communication and got my degree in that. I was working almost full-time going to college, so I squeezed four years into six but was able to graduate with very little debt, which was important to me. So what I learned was that a communication degree doesn't get you very far in life. And I'll tell you a quick story. So I basically either could choose between working for a nonprofit, which basically they weren't paying very much, thus the word nonprofit, or I could work for a small startup software company. So I chose that. And as I went there, I realized I was a fish out of water. These were engineers. There was a highly technical field. I was the one marketing person. In a small business, there were about seven of us. I quickly learned some of the perils of being an employee in a very small business. One was your paycheck bouncing. So I would write a check to my church. And I remember the pastor calling me saying, hey, Derek, I don't know how to tell you this, but your tithing check actually bounced. Well, I was mortified. I mean, this was a check, not just to the restaurant where it's a bounce check, but this is to my church, for goodness sakes. It didn't happen once, but twice. And then he was famous for on about five o'clock at Friday, he would let everybody know, by the way, tomorrow, Saturday is going to be a work day. We need to get some work done here at the office. Well, I'd have to call my (laughs) wife and break the plans we had. So I realized about a year and a half into this that I was at a fork in the road. I could either choose to continue to be an employee and basically be dependent on someone else to tell me my value based on an evaluation every year, or I could take the path of courage, bet on myself, and go on my own. And really what led me to come to this conclusion was I was passed over for a bonus that a lot of the engineers got, but the marketing department didn't get. And I realized, okay, my days may be numbered here. So I then began to go back to school and study to become a financial advisor on the weekends and the evenings while working full time. And then about three months later, decided to put in my notice, made the break. The odds were against me in many respects. People said, Derek, you don't have enough cash reserves. What will you do if you fail? But I realized we didn't have any kids then. I was young enough where even if the risk didn't pay off, I could still go back and get another job if I needed to. 
But I just felt like it was time to back myself against the wall and really put all the chips on Derek and let's see how this wheel spins. And how old were you at this point? So I was 24. Okay. Okay. So you're in your mid 20s and you've got a taste of the employee, the W 2 world. And it sounds like that startup, I was part of a lot of startups. I used to be in the video game design world. So I was in a number of startups. And you're absolutely right. It can be very up and down in the culture. It's great getting in on the ground floor because there's this big vision and all hands on deck, but it can mean a lot of bumps and ups and downs along the way. And I think it's so wise and so fortunate that you had that experience so early on and had that awareness to really think, wait a second, I'm relying on somebody else. I'm not in control here. I want to be in control. I want to bet on myself. And so at an early age, you decided to strike out on your own. And so you became a financial advisor and you started your own business. So tell us about that and that journey. How did that go? So here I was 24 years old. I looked myself in the mirror and said, who's going to trust this guy with their money? (laughs) I didn't have any gray hair. There was no look of maturity or wisdom about me. And I was at a real crossroads because I knew this was the field for me. I had seen other advisors. I had experienced this with our family in the past and some seminars we had gone to. That's what I want to do. The thought of making money and helping other people make money was a beautiful thing. And the thought of the more money they made, then I would make money as well. It was a real value add. We're all rowing in the same boat in the same direction together. But the dilemma that I had was, how could I bring in business? And one of the aha moments that I experienced was working with the media. And what I realized was if I could become a recognized expert, whether it be on radio, TV, et cetera, that could really help elevate and give me a quantum leap in my business growth. So I had this idea, I would get to the office about five in the morning once a week, And I would send faxes for those of your listeners who know what that is. You put paper in, shoots paper out back in the old school days. And I would. You were really committed. I was committed. (laughs) Well, what I wanted to do was I wanted to catch these TV producers when they were the least busy and when I would have their focus. So if I could catch them like at five in the morning, they're still prepping for the morning show. And I would let them know if you need someone to talk about financial topics in an easy to understand way, call me or I would give them a list of possible topics of what I can help make sense for their viewers. It took about three months. Finally, a call came from one of the local affiliates and they said, Derek, we'd love to have you on there. And I said, great. I love doing television, having never been on before. (laughs) But I really found that by putting my back against the wall, it forced me to A, take action and B, be prepared when the opportunity came. So I recruited my wife. She would sit on the couch across from me. I had her ask me questions. I just visualized this whole interview. And what I thought about Annie was, look, I want them at the end of this interview to say to me, Derek, we want you to be a regular on our show. We feel like you're natural in this environment. The interview went great, just as I had visualized, just as I had practiced. And I'll never forget the producer said, Derek, I know you probably hear this a lot, but you're really made for television. Would you mind coming on on a regular basis? And I said, I would And you were like, I don't know. I got to check my schedule. I'm really booked. (laughs) Let me have my people call your people, you know? That's right. And that's how it started right there. So what that did is that gave me a quantum leap, first of all, in my own personal confidence I could bet on myself and I could come through, but also it allowed a door to begin to open of new clients to come in because when they see people on TV, a great podcast like this, there's credibility, there's implied authority that separates you and and does what I like to call decommoditizes people in a crowded marketplace. And it lets them build a relationship with you before you even know them. And so that worked really, really well. So I really think that those early days and those decisions I made to get up early, get to the office and bet on myself again, really helped grow the business in a shorter amount of time than it might take other advisors to build their practice. 
It's so smart to think outside of the box where I think a lot of other people would just be hustling, handing out their business cards and trying to go, you know, one by one by one, get referrals and whatnot. But to really think outside the box and to think, how can I stand out? How can I elevate myself? And what a great break that you got so early on. And so a ton of success. And you mentioned one thing I wanted to dig further into, which is that you knew that you could take complex financial topics and make them easy to understand. And I know that that's in many ways, that's a gift. That's a talent that a lot of people are not able to do because once you get to a certain level of knowledge, right? What is it called? You forget what it's like to be a beginner right. and it becomes very difficult to make things easy to understand again. So is that something that you've always had? Is that something that you've been able to develop through practice? Tell us a little bit about that. So I didn't know it at the time, nor did I call it this at the time, Annie, but I believe in what I call the focus group principle. I'll give an example. About five years ago, my son came in our bathroom of our master bedroom, and he was concerned about, do these jeans look nice on him? And my wife gave her feedback. I said, son, they look great. But I said, you know what you ought to do? You need to ask your sisters what they think about it. And they all came in and said, Dylan, this looks great. You look great. And he's like, I don't think it looks good. I said, Dylan, let me give you a life lesson right here. It doesn't really matter what you think you look like. If other people think you look good, then go with it. And eventually you'll begin to believe that you look good in those things. And I tied that back early in my career to what I realized was people would tell me, you know, Derek, you're able to take money topics that are complex and really make it easy for me to understand. So it wasn't something I recognized in myself, Annie, right off the bat, but people began to tell me that. And I began to realize if not one, not two, but multiple people are saying this consistently and my messaging is consistent that must mean it's true. And so I then began to brand myself as the easy to understand financial advisor. And it began to elevate me and set me apart in a crowded marketplace because the reality was people could choose any financial advisor in the local area. There's no shortage of people that want to manage your money. But when it came to differentiate yourself to own up a little part of their brain, when they had an event that wanted and they needed a financial advisor, I wanted them to think of me. And what this parlays itself into also is I began to give back in my local community because I'm a big fan of education. Education is something that everybody's a fan of. And also every parent wants to give their kid every possible opportunity. Never met anyone that doesn't. They may not be able to afford it, but they sure want it. And so I would give month the local schools to recognize a teacher of the month the Derek Kenny Teacher of the Month or the Derek Kenny Student of the Month is $50. I mean, for me, I might spend $50 doing whatever, but to these teachers and to those students, it was like hitting the lotto. But what happened is I would take a picture, send it to the newspaper, and they would publish it. Well, recently after that, I began to get calls from people saying, hey, we'd like to work with you. And I finally said, if you don't mind me asking, why are you choosing me of all the other advisors you could pick? Why did you call my office? They said, Derek, because we like what you do supporting education. And it was, it was a mind-blowing moment of, wow, so I simply give back to the community and people like it. And what came out of that was really the crux of my new business. And that is how do we tie people's cash to their cause, their money to meaning, and really putting purpose to their profits? Because what I found is, People want to get good money advice. They want to make money, but they also want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to be part of a bigger story that they can easily walk through the door and not have to do the work. They want someone else to burn the brain cells for them so they can simply benefit from what you've already done. Yep. Could not have said it better. That's exactly what we've found through our business as well, that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And they want to do good in the world. And I know that's a big part of what you talk about through your framework and you teach people is money is not a bad thing. Money magnifies the goodness in people. And so before we get into the framework, because I do want to dive in there, 
So I know you've talked to a lot of people over the years about many different financial topics. And so give us a few of the most like common ones that people struggle with or some of the more complex ones that you were able to help people to simplify. Well, I'll give you one example. This is an extreme example, but in my practice, we had quite a few lottery winners and we had a lot of people who inherited money. And you would think most people would say, my goodness, if I inherited a million dollars or I won a million dollars, my life would be set. I wouldn't have any worries, no frustrations, no money concerns at all. What we found though was, is that the beliefs that you bring in prior to receiving that money or winning it are exactly the beliefs you will carry out once you have that money. For example, if you're filming a movie and you pick an actor who's really not talented, well, they're going to be really not talented in your movie. (laughs) An example I would give you a woman, she inherited about $2 million and we put a nice plan together to last her the rest of her life. But what began to happen, and we warned her about this, is every relative that she knew or didn't even know came knocking at her door asking, hey, can I get some money for this? Can you loan me money for this business opportunity? That's a can't lose deal. We've all seen those. Mm -hmm. Or can you help pay for my school or help me get out of debt? Well, she began to realize that she simply couldn't say no. So she comes in the office, we hear what's happening, and we practice some scripts with her. And I said, look, I want you to paint me as the bad person in this story. And you tell them, my financial advisor said I can only spend X amount to make sure I can have money for my retirement and do the things I want to do. So put it on me. Well, what she began to realize was she wanted to be viewed as this giving person to her family that could never say no. The problem was in less than six months, that $2 million was whittled down to $1 million. A million dollars in six months, it's hard to even fathom. And then it dropped down to about 500,000. I actually moved her on and said, you know what? I don't want to be here when this whole thing crashes down. Our advice helped it last longer than it probably should have, which was a benefit to her. But the bottom line was she had no experience managing that level of money. And it all came out, even as we coached her month by month on what to do, what to say, she couldn't handle the peer pressure that she put on herself and she faced from other people. So lesson one was, you've got to know what's important for you. You've got to know what your money story is, and you're the main character in it, and we want to help you win your money story. I'll tell you another example, and this is... I thought that peer pressure went away, Annie, when I graduated high school. I remember you wake up in the morning and there's that fresh pimple on your face or the (laughs) clothes you thought matched Mm -hmm. or were clean aren't there. And you're like, how am I going to make it today? Oh my gosh. Well, then you graduate thinking, okay, at least that part of my life is in the rear view mirror. But I realize (laughs) it sneaks back up on you when it comes time to buy things like a house a car. Mm. And this surprised me where you send your kids to college. Now, this blew my mind as I would talk to people, they would talk about, well, my son or daughter goes to so-and-so school and my son or daughter. Whoa, this was a college they couldn't afford, but it was all about the status and the prestige. And what I found is, and this is one of the benefits that has come out the past couple of years is frugality has become fun again. And it's actually fun to say now, you know what, that's really not part of my financial goals right now, but here's what we're doing that's best for us financially. Well, nobody can argue with if you've got a plan for yourself financially and you are confident delivering it, but when you waver and try to keep up with the Joneses, if you will, that's a game that you'll lose at every single time. We'll get back to our conversation with Derek in just a minute. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment? Perhaps you're afraid, like we were, that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. 
We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest and we'll take it from there. That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And now, back to our chat with Derek Kinney. Yeah, I think you're so right. I think another part it sounds like that sets you apart from other financial advisors is that coaching piece. I certainly, when I taught back in the day, when I had a financial advisor, they were like, okay, based on the based on your financial picture, here's what we recommend. You buy into this, you buy this. In five years, this will happen. In 10 years, this will happen. Here are the numbers, right? And it sounds like you really went out of your way to help people figure out because everybody comes with their own money story, like you you mentioned, right? Some people have a lot of baggage. Some people use money to attach meaning to money in certain ways. So it sounds like you really help to coach people through those situations. And is that part of your the good money framework? Yeah. So a quick story. I was a financial advisor for 25 years and actually sold that business about a year ago. I'll tell you more about that story a little bit later. But with Good Money Framework, what I learned was, A, there's a lot of what I call villainization of people with money. So think about the most successful people out there. So let's go back and look at the pandemic together, Andy. Okay. So when you think about the pandemic, what changed in all of our lives? Well, first of all, we really couldn't go to the mall anymore. You couldn't go out and buy things. So who was the recipient of a lot of that? Amazon.com, Walmart.com. I couldn't go to the gym. So a lot of people bought Peloton bikes. So there you have that. A lot of people didn't make food at home or go to restaurants they had food delivery. So think about Chipotle or Domino's Pizza or Pizza Hut. So there were some beneficiaries of a lot of our hard-earned money. And so what I'm getting my head around is there's a lot of criticism now directed at people who head those companies, for example. So is it their fault that in the pandemic, their companies happen to add the most value at the time that people needed that value the most? I know I was thankful to order a hard drive from my computer and have it show up two hours later from the Amazon delivery person. I was thankful to have these other opportunities. And so what I look at is, am I defending the rich or the wealthy? No, I'm not attempting to define how they run their business or how they run their lives or their companies. What I'm saying is, as opposed to defend them, let's demystify what it means to be wealthy. And so the challenge that I would have for your listeners and I work with people on a regular basis is, what can you do? What idea or product or service have you thought about or what pain point have you personally experienced or you've seen other people experience it? You said, you know what? There's a better way. I know there's a better way because if you don't come up with this or pursue it, someone else will. It always happens. And so that's what I began to process was, you know what? People say that money is bad or people that have a lot of money are bad. And I come against that, not to defend the person. I'm not defending the ultra wealthy, but I'm just saying, what can we learn from them? Because money follows value. If I have a pain point and I have a problem that needs to be solved, 
my money will closely follow that solution like a dog to a bone. And so the first premise of our new business is debunking that money is bad, but instead that money is good and helping change the conversation around, I want you to go make money and actually go make a lot of it but now use it for good. And what we want to tie that to is not what most financial advisors talk about. We just want you to be able to retire and travel the world and go see and do, which is great. All that is great. But ultimately, if there's not meaning tied to the money, it can lead to an unsatisfying feeling. And we want to come against that and really motivate people, go make money, but tie it to what I call your generosity purpose. That cause that you hold deep in your heart that you feel passionate about. It's that injustice, that wrong you want to right, that cause that you know you want to make a difference in, but you didn't know how to do it. And if you can actually go make more money to help solve that, you'll actually make more money while you're giving more money away. It's a really beautiful concept that we're seeing hundreds of people, if not thousands around the country, just start to put into place. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, my internet's kind of in and out. I'm sure we'll edit edit this out, but this conversation where it's heading is so, I think, important and central to what Annie and I do at Good Egg and why we do it. And what gets us out of bed every morning is, I still remember early conversations that I had with Annie. I'm like, you want to do big, big things? And I was like, we're not there yet. We're not making the money. And I think there was a conflict between her and I in terms of how she viewed money and the idea of making more money and the way that I saw it. And I knew that if we made more money, that we could have a greater impact. And it's so cool because here we are now just coming off the heels of one of our biggest deals to date. We're in like less than 30 days going to close a $57 million apartment building that three and a half years ago when we first started was just a dream. But when we think about all of the impact that we're going to be able to do as a result of helping all of these people make more money and build their wealth is everything for Annie and I. So I love I love all of that. And I love what you had said earlier, tie cash to cause, money to meaning, profits to their purpose is so on point with everything that we do. And I think a big reason why people want to work with us, because it's not at the end of the day for Annie and I just to get out there and make a bunch of money for ourselves and go on vacation, as you had mentioned. So <laughs> I love all of that. I did want to ask you a couple of questions that I have just out of curiosity from a financial advisor standpoint. There's obviously young families that we work with in our business, people who have children, younger children. And the big question that I get all the time is around college savings. And so I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are around college, the future of education. We talked about it a little bit earlier, this idea of like, oh, we've got to go to the best college and, and you know what all of that means. But what are your thoughts around the direction of college? Where are we heading with that? Do you feel like it's still relevant, valuable in 20 years, people who are just starting to have babies now? What are your thoughts around that? And, and if you think college is valuable, what kind of college savings tools are you advising your clients to use? Well, college is certainly the tool that most people view as the ticket to long-term success. Most parents today would say, look, if I can just give my son or daughter a college degree, they're off my payroll and they now are set for life. What I would say is that is changing and changing rapidly. So let me back up and share a couple of thoughts. First of all, it's vital that you and your spouse, your partner have a vision for what it is you want for your son or daughter. And then it's very important at an early age to begin dialoguing with your son or daughter on expectations. The shock and awe approach of surprising your son or daughter the night they graduate high school is an ineffective approach. <laughs> and it doesn't build trust. It simply erodes the relationship because what you're teaching your kids is can I trust mom or dad to tell me what's raw and real with our money? More is caught than taught. And so you don't want to put yourself in that position, have to go back and backfill and kind of grovel your way back in. A couple of years before they graduate high school, have the discussion. Here's what mom and dad can afford. Here's our plan. Here's our expectation of you. I'll give you an example. With our own kids, given the fact that my upbringing is different than my children's upbringing. It's just how generations change. 
I put in place for my kids what I call the half and half program, where they can basically pick any school they want to go to. I will pay half, but then they're on the hook for half. Now, what that teaches is, look, I'm not a big believer that the Ivy schools or private schools are the way to go. I'm a product of a state school, and I realized quickly, it doesn't matter where you go to college at, it matters what you do with what you learned at that college. That's the simple fundamental principle that I operate by, and I've seen it proven over and over again, especially since I've graduated. Nobody really cares where I graduated college. They just want to know, do you have the competence and the authority and the trustworthiness and the empathy to guide me to my financial goals. That's all the matter. So have the discussion with your kids early, give them a game plan that everybody buys into. Some parents we've coached around even incentivizing their kids. Look, if you give more scholarships, that will reduce down your part of it. Okay. So that's one way to think about it. I am no longer convinced, Julie, to your question, that college is the only way to go. Now, here's the battle, though. Let's define the stakes and what's at play right now. Culture today still says that a college degree not only has value, but a high amount of value. That if an employer is looking at different resumes, one with a college degree, one without a college degree, the one with the college degree is going to get more eyeball time on that piece of paper. So that'll need to be debunked over time. What we are finding though now is people want the risk removed. So no employer, in my understanding and what I've observed, even as an employer myself, wants your job to be the first job the person's ever had. Most employers prefer you to have cut your teeth on somebody else's dime, then you're the recipient of that experience, if that makes sense. So a wise job seeker today, a wise college graduate can talk about the skills they acquired while in college, the internships they went on, the interviews they did with successful people, the books they read, the business opportunities they failed and succeeded at. Because what that does is it tells me this person is more than just a sheet of paper which commoditizes them again. They decommoditize themselves by really adding value even before they came to me to look for a job. So, Now, let's be candid, though. Do I think most parents are prepared to have that discussion that I just said? Probably not. They may have grown up barely making ends meet. They may not feel successful financially themselves. So why would they have the confidence to have that discussion? So what I'm saying right now is be curious with your kids. You do it all in real estate, whether it's stocks, bonds, have the discussion and say, you know what? I don't have the answer to that but let's be curious together. And one of the core principles that we've gotten great feedback on from people is teach your kids not to be the recipient of money, but rather the creator of money. And what that means is to go into the workforce thinking, how can I begin to launch my own business, my own side hustle, my own side gig, where they use the day job to buy them time to keep their bills current, make a little bit of progress, but then to do research and development on themselves. I mentioned the focus group earlier to see what people tell them, you're really good at this. This is a talent that I see you have naturally that they could parlay that into their own gig to either use that to pay off debt more quickly, save for the kid's retirement, or launch their own business entirely. So it's all about flipping the script that this nine to five job is the way to go. I want to tear that up and throw it out the window, but we want to make sure that you're not just moving from one job to the next one. You want to make sure you have a clear plan, but I think knowing how to be the creator of money is the first step. I love that. So for people out there who might still be thinking about college or thinking that their child wants to become an entrepreneur and they're trying to figure out ways to start saving now or to start building wealth now for that time down the road, what kind of advice are you giving around that? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's the traditional 529 plans. There's the education IRA. All of those are good. And I think they should be taken advantage of, but don't lose the lesson in helping your kids save for their own goals. 
So here's what I mean by that. Sometimes in a 529 plan, there's more of the prepackaged options of here's the mutual fund you can pick from. So there's not as much surgery that gets to be done where you get to kind of pick and hand select and craft what that portfolio looks like. Instead, what you may want to think about is a non-qualified brokerage account. So non-IRA, you can buy and sell, whether it's mutual funds, exchange traded funds, individual stocks, and enroll your kids and ask them this question, son or daughter, what are some of the clothing items or electronic items that you and your friends like the most? Start with something they like and know. Well, I love my Apple phone. I love my Adidas shoes. I love all this other stuff that's out there. Well, why don't we look at maybe buying some stock in those companies? Because if you're thinking that you like it, there's probably hundreds of thousands of other kids your same age that like it as well. So they begin to see the trends that, you know, if I like it, I bet other people do as well, but it teaches them that things can go up and things can go down. I bought some Bitcoin and some Ethereum uh, with my kids recently, and I wanted them to see, hey, it looks like it's easy money right now, but then the drop came. And you think the roller coasters are reserved for just six flags. Oh, no, 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 no. It (laughs) occurs to your investments as well. So I wanted them to see eyes wide open how these things work. But I think it's more than just saving for your kids. And I applaud the people that do that. That's great. But if you lose the lesson, you know, if you imagine your kids going to college and they actually know how to invest and they've lost money and they've seen you lose money and how emotionally that you process that and how losing money doesn't dictate how mom or dad responds in the day or the week. It's just part of the game of money that really can give them a good blueprint and a framework for wanting to make money and that it's good and not bad. I think from an early age that being facing a situation like that where you're seeing money, potentially your own money, right? Go up and down. It forces you to face your own emotions and your own money story at such a young age to realize that, no, money isn't everything. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. It's just a tool. And what a gift that you're giving your kids by allowing them to have that experience early on while at home and to guide them through that. That is very cool. Well, I'll share a story with you. Even thinking back through the pandemic, it was the one time that we've had where all six of us were on the dinner table for weeks at a time. And one of the thoughts that I had, you know, we would go around the table and talk about how was your day? How was your day? And hey, dad, how was your day? Oh, it was a good day at the office. Got a lot done. Nobody really cared candidly about dad's day. Okay. Let's just call it like it is. But when I said to them, you know what, guys, I made a really stupid mistake today. Suddenly, their eyes got as big as saucers and they were glued on dad. And it was share your problem and the lesson you learned moment. Now, was that embarrassing for me? Yes. But I realized if I'm going to be real and raw and transparent with my kids and teach them to do the same, I can't just talk it. I've got to walk it. And so I would tell them, hey, today was a good day in the market. This one investment that we picked did well, or you know, I lost a couple thousand dollars today. Oh, dad, how does it? Well, it doesn't feel good, but it's just part of the process. So talking them through emotionally how to respond to money and that it's not always up, it's not always down, but it's part of the process was really, really helpful. And so even right now, for those of you listening, ask yourself, what are some mistakes that may be embarrassing? but are worthwhile sharing regardless of the age of your kids. You can bring it up. You're not going to believe what happened to me today. Really? What? And then you share something that just endears that relationship and it builds trust that mom and dad, A, aren't perfect, but they care and they want to make sure that they know how we can best use money to really move the ball forward. It's so funny because I think one recurring theme that I hear from what all of what you're saying, Derek, is that What's really important, and I know Annie and I are big believers of this as well, remember to engage your children at a very young age, just like you said, no matter how old they are, and Annie and I have been doing this since our kids were pretty young, in all of the conversations around money and the decisions that you will make for them, and most of the time and when we grew up, it was like the decision was made, you're going to college. There really isn't a choice in that. It's already made, but this idea of really asking them and bringing them into the conversation at a very young age 
age and letting them know that this is something that could be helpful or might not be for them. It really depends on what they want to do. But really opening up that conversation early on, I think, is so important and something that Annie and I believe in. I've been talking to my kids about investing since my oldest one was four. She's nine now. Just helped her build out her first business, small business that she kind of tested on us a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about PL statements and overspending and income and hiring other people and all kinds of fun stuff like that. It's so fun to watch her at nine just be so excited about all of that. And I think for me, I see entrepreneurship has been so fun to be in, to share with my kids on the journey that I've been, all the ups and downs that I've gone through <laughs> over the last couple of years and to give them the chance to see how it goes. There's sometimes you win and sometimes you don't win and how you deal with that. So love, love, love this conversation so much out of this that I know resonates with Annie as well as me. But we're going to move into the last part of our show, the Life and Money Show Spotlight. We're going to ask you a couple of questions around life and money. So the first question is around your life and money. So what is one thing that you are doing right now to live a meaningful and intentional life by design? Well, giving is a key component of me. As I've thought about even growing up as a kid, I just always felt in my heart, I wanted to give back. And so what I realized was the accelerant of that was to go make money so that I could give more money away. And the way to do that was to help other clients make money. So now it's almost supercharged because there are causes that we believe in, whether it be our church or in our community specifically, I've always got my giving antennas up that I call it of how do I keep kind of this open hand approach I want to be a good steward of what I've been given, but also if there is a need, I want to respond to it. And you may feel embarrassed. You may feel like, well, how's the person going to respond? But I realize I'd rather feel embarrassed and make an impact than not feel embarrassed and have left that need for someone else to solve. Love that so much. I think when we think about just like I was saying earlier, what Annie and I do, it's been such a big part of everything for us to be able to be successful so that we can help others be more successful as well. And even in our coaching program as well, it's about how do we help them be successful in their business to learn what we do so that they can go and help more people. And it just has been so rewarding for us to watch our businesses grow and watch the impact that our clients, our investors have been able to make in their own lives and the lives of others. So I love that. It's a beautiful thing. I would just add, that's yeah. why I really was excited to come on your podcast because you are doing what you're advocating people to do. And I think that's what attracts people to businesses like yours is it's one thing to say, I want to give, but if they see you doing it and they then get some cachet by being affiliated with you, now they're a community advocate just like you are. They then want to be part of that bigger story. So I, I could not congratulate both of you more because of what you're doing and really the example you're setting, which I think is so, so powerful. Oh, well, thank you so much. That means a lot. Annie and I work very hard. Yeah. <laughs> we take this very serious and we work very hard and so happy and proud of everything. But thank you for the kind words. All right. Second question is around others' life and money. So what is one life or money hack that you might be able to share with the audience that'll make an impact in their lives right now? Yeah. You know, one thing that's very simple right now is I call it capture and keep. And this is to call on your commodity expenses. So your electricity, your homeowners, your automobile insurance, those things that are valuable, but you could get from anybody and ask them, look, I'm comparison shopping right now. Is that the best possible rate that you can do? And oftentimes you pause. It's often the first one that talks next loses. So we don't want to do that. And they may come back. You know what, Derek, we've got this rate for new customers that we can extend to people thinking about leaving. And then the game I play is I then want to capture and then keep those savings. The worst thing is, hey, great. I saved 200 bucks a month. I'm going to go buy a truck. And now I'm sentencing myself to this five years worth of payments. Instead, I want to use that found money. I want to keep it and pay off debt or I want to give part of it. Let's say any savings I find, I'm going to give 10% of that, 20% of that. It's an incentive for you to take care of the causes you believe in, which sometimes might just be your own debt or a cause in the community, but it gives you a reason to do that and a motivation to save money and move that forward. Mm -hmm. 
My husband is a big believer of that. <laughs> He's always calling different companies and asking if he could get, uh, you know, some kind of a different rate. And he's pretty successful with that. But I like that second half of it, which is once you save the money, figure out where to put it and how to put it to use and make an impact with that. So I love that. All right. Last question is around life and money in the world. So what is one thing that you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Well, I like to think that the whole good money framework concept is really allowing people to flip their old script. In other words, if they thought about money in a certain way of, hey, my goal is just to retire or just make it to Friday, it's how can they go into that job every day or that company and realize, I want to grow my sales, I want to make an impact in my business so I can give more money. And it's this contagiousness that occurs that the more that happens, the more drives you to want to do better, add more value to your customers, and you're adding value to the world. So I hope that my message really motivates people as we continue to build that out. My book will come out in February of next year to give more details on it. But that's my goal is how can we rethink about how we've always thought about money? Well, it's very clear, Derek, from everything that you've shared with us that you genuinely care and that you have a heart for giving back. And I know that our listeners are going to want to follow up with you, learn more about your Good Money Framework and listen to your podcast. So share with them what's the best place that they can go to follow you to learn more about all that you're doing. Well, a great way to follow me is on Instagram at Derek. T. Kenny. Also, you can follow us on the web at goodmoneyframework.com. We've got a couple of free downloadables. We want to make sure that we're helping people, especially with their kids, craft their money message that money is not bad and good people should have more of it. Derek Kinney, creator of Good Money Framework and host of the Good Money Podcast. Derek, thank you so much for being here with us and our listeners today. Annie and Julie, it's been a real pleasure. I have counted this a treasure to be with you and really applaud the work you're doing. Keep up the great work. You've been listening to The Life and Money Show, the number one podcast for people who, like you, are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth, and making an impact in the world. For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com and be sure to join the Life and Money Show community on Facebook. And if you got value out of this show, please subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations. Conversations.